Hi, welcome back to the Radio Mechanic, and thank you for stopping by. One of my viewers requested that I take a uh, tour, video tour of the shack or the uh, lab here, and uh, he called me a gearhead, and I suppose by that he means I like to collect gear. Uh, that used to mean that we loved to work on cars and motorcycles, but I take it as a compliment at any rate. And uh, so I'm going to give you a brief tour of the uh, laboratory. Up here in the top, we have an old solar capacitor tester. Now, anyone who works on antique radios, old tube sets, this is an indispensable piece of equipment. Um, there are various ones out there. Ico made them. Heathkit made them. There's some military grade ones out there that are quite expensive, but very nice. And you say, why is that old piece of equipment so important? Well, the old paper capacitors that are in those radios leak. And without fail, you should replace each and every one of them. Now, I've seen some videos where the guys are testing with voltmeters. And uh, even these voltmeters here, these old triplets that had a 30 volt battery in them, are not high enough voltage to test for the breakdown or leakage in these capacitors. I, without fail, just replace every paper cap in there. Now, I will go in and test the mica capacitors, the ones that look like dominoes. 90% of the time, they're fine. But if they're leaking, you can test them at their actual operating voltage. There's a knob here that allows you to increase the voltage and test for leakage and find out once and for all. Why should you change them? It'll affect the biasing on the next stage. You could burn up an IF coil. There's many reasons. Won't go into it, a lot of videos out there covering that. Off to the right of that is an old homemade noise figure meter that I made uh, 20 years ago probably, and uh, that's been replaced by a Hewlett Packard piece of equipment. Down here we have an inductance bridge. This one uh, is Boonton, who became, or who was purchased by Hewlett Packard. Extremely accurate. A little bit slow to use, but as dead accurate today as it was when it left the factory. I've got uh, inductance standards that show this thing to be within, well within specification, which is, you know, very small percentages. Over here, this is its companion capacitance bridge, and there's many various models of this. Again, an extremely accurate piece of equipment. If you need to know down to the tenth of a picofarad, this will do it. And sitting on top of it is one of my many capacitance standards and a differential probe for the scope. And traveling over here, we have a Krohn height filter. It can be used for high pass, low pass, band pass. This covers from about 20 hertz up to 2 megahertz. And you VLF guys would find this very useful. You can set this to cover, say, a band, a band pass of 100 to 150 kilohertz, and it will reject everything 60 cycle and everything broadcast above and below it. Very useful. Uh, I can pull NDB beacons out of the noise with this thing like you wouldn't believe. You take a look at the spectrum on a, on an SDR radio, and it's nothing but broadcast and noise and interference. Turn this filter on, the beacon comes right up out of the noise. Uh, up here on the top, I need a pointer of some kind. Hang on just a second. Up here we have an atomic frequency standard. Uh, this one happens to be a rubidium oscillator. They call these secondary frequency standards because they're not quite as accurate as a cesium standard or as accurate as the things that the Bureau of Standards using. But for, for most ham radio operators, this thing is far more accurate than you'll ever ever need. Uh, just below it we have a Wavetech 100 megahertz synthesized uh, frequency generator or actually a function generator you know you can do triangle form square wave blah 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 anything you need and just below that is a Hewlett Packard pulse generator. We have a uh, an 18 gigahertz uh, from 10 hertz up to 18 gigahertz and it'll read out in one hertz 
uh, right down to the hertz at 18 gigahertz. That is running off of, and let me lower the camera here, things might get shaky. I'll do a break. Cut. Okay, down below here, we have, and I'm going to move the camera over, hope it doesn't get too shaky. This is a GPS disciplined oscillator. This is a 10 megahertz oscillator that has an antenna up on my tower and it uses a GPS reference which is tied back to the Bureau of Standards. That's accurate to about 20 millihertz at 10 megahertz. And to put that in perspective, if you were to multiply that up to 10 gigahertz, you'd be off two hertz. Uh, I used to use the rubidium standard Checked it against this and found this was actually slightly better than my old rubidium standard by oh, 40 millihertz or so. So I'm using that one. Just below it, we just have a small cheap frequency counter and an old voltmeter. That's tied in to one of my Q meters. This is an old Hewlett Packard Q meter. This is for measuring the quality of a coil. And I'll probably do a video on that sometime in the near future. But right now we've got a coil on there showing a Q of nearly 300. And you can tell, say you want to check a plastic, see if it's suitable for a coil form. Well, as you can see, the coil Q has lowered. Yes, it's detuned a little bit, but if I retune it, it will still be much lower than it was. Where this plastic has virtually no effect at all on the tuning. You can see that would make a good coil form. They have many uses. Uh, you don't see many of these around anymore. These are still fairly expensive. These are still going for about $400. It replaced my older Boonton Q meter, and uh, I'll do a video comparing the two of them one of these days. Next to that, we have a reactance meter. This is, again, a piece of Boonton equipment. This was probably built in the 1950s. Still works as well as it did the day it was manufactured. Boonton again was purchased by Hewlett Packard and all they did is rebadge these at some point to say Hewlett Packard on them. And if you want to know the reactance of a coil or its impedance at a given frequency, you can mount your coil up there, tune in the frequency you want down here, dial in some capacitance so it resonates, and it will give you an exact reactance readout over here. Uh, you can also do that thing with a vector network analyzer, but if you're doing a lot of coils repetitively of one type, this is actually a little bit quicker to use. If you're doing multiple frequencies, it's much slower, but if you want to just do one frequency, zero in on one frequency, these are still very useful pieces of equipment. By the way, this piece of equipment here covers about 20 kilohertz up to 70 megahertz. Over here, on the end, I'll tell you what, let's move the camera again. I hope we don't get too shaky. Over here on the end, we have another Q meter. This one covers 20 megahertz to 260 megahertz. So you hams out there will build your own amplifiers or wind coils for your own equipment. This will take you up into the 220 megahertz band. You mount your coil here, measure the Q, and you can immediately see why it's important to use a thicker tank coil than thinner wire. This will give you a direct reading on just how good or how bad your tank coil is. Down here we have a computer. Oops, we just switched over to screensaver. I wasn't quick enough getting back to this thing. Where'd it go? Come on back. Anyway, we have a vector network analyzer. This one happens to be an array solutions down here does all your S parameters and all the other functions you'd expect to get from a high-end uh, vector network analyzer, but only costs about $1,000. And will operate up to about 1.2 gigahertz. And let's see if we can get this thing to bring the screen back here. Uh. There we go. You've got your impedance, your uh, SWR, your phase angle, there are any number of parameters you can put on this screen. It's just a matter of setting it up differently. I found this extremely useful for tuning duplexers, uh, circular isolators, bandpass filters, what have you. You just connect them in between the two ports and you get all your parameters 
are displayed. You can save it, print it, so on and so forth. Very, very handy piece of equipment. Uh, let's see, what else have we got? We've got so much stuff in here. I'm going to break this and move over to the other bench. Okay, over here we have a 1 gigahertz bandwidth LaCroix scope, four channels. And sitting on top of it is a monitor that feeds off the VGA output of this guy so you can blow the screen up and see it more easily from across the room. Uh, I also have one of the active 1 gigahertz probes for this. If you price these things, it'll make you swallow your tongue, so I only got one of those. Um, I'll put a link up here in the top that'll show you where to go and find out why it's so important to have an active probe or a very low capacitance probe. It can be very, very, very important to do so. We have a signal generator, AM, FM, with various, you know, functions. This goes from 0.1 to 1,040 megahertz or 100 kilohertz to uh, 1.04 gigahertz. Uh, below that, we have a noise figure meter. We use that for testing preamplifiers and making sure that everything's running the spec. If you build a preamplifier and you want to tweak it for a low noise figure, you need one of those. Below that, we have a seven and a half digit Hewlett Packard voltmeter. I used to have one of the flukes that Mr. Carlson has sitting on his rack beneath his oscilloscopes, but found this to be a little bit better meter. One more digit, plus it has auto zero function, which the fluke did not. The fluke required seven button pushes to zero the meter, which I found a little bit annoying. Uh, down below here, we have a 400 megahertz analog bandwidth Tektronics four channel. Uh, it's an old analog scope, one of their last real good oscilloscopes. It came with a real honest to God service manual that showed you all the schematics plus theory of operation. You don't get that anymore. Uh, it has all the on-screen measurement functions and having a nice uh, wide bandwidth analog scope is really, really useful. Just above that we have an old Hewlett Packard 8924C uh, mobile station test set. What is that? Well, it's basically a spectrum analyzer with an internal sweep generator so you could call it a scalar analyzer. This one actually has a 100 watt continuous input, which is very rare. This one was kitted out with all the options. You can transmit into this directly 100 watts continuous while you're looking at the spectrum for uh, spurious signals. It also includes a built-in two-tone generator, so you can run your two-tone signal into your audio circuit and check for uh, proper operation of your sideband transmitters. It will do, generate PL tones, it will decode PL tones. Basically, it does soup to nuts. It only goes from 400 kilohertz to 1 gigahertz. Now, it's spec 30 megahertz to 1 gigahertz. And the original one, the A version of this, uh, was spec completely from 400 to 1 gigahertz. But they were having trouble with spurious signals internally on this, so they put a filter in the front end. However, this is still extremely useful. It starts rolling off about 4 or 5 dB when you get down to 1 megahertz and probably drops off 20 dB by the time you're down to 400 kilohertz. However, that is more than enough uh, sensitivity to still do uh, tuning of IF transformers and old radios. You sweep the input you look at the spectrum, you can shape the IF, you can make it a little bit broader than you're ever going to get trying to do it with the voltmeter method and uh, clean up the audio a little bit. Uh, very handy to have. Uh, up here we have an old Tektronics 200 megahertz uh, two-channel digital what they call a real-time oscilloscope. This thing's starting to show its age a little bit but still useful on the bench. But this is one of the Tektronics, the service manual for these is a joke. Uh, you go in there and read the service manual, the service thing says check this voltage, this voltage, and this voltage, and if it doesn't work, replace the power supply. Or check this signal, and this signal, and this signal, and if they're not correct, replace this board. It doesn't tell you how to fix anything, there's no schematics in it, it's worthless. 
And up here we have an all Heath kit high voltage power supply that'll give you about 400 volts at 100 milliamps, and it'll also supply B voltage up to uh, 150 volts at about 4 milliamps for uh, biasing. Still kind of a handy piece of equipment to have around the shack. And we're going to gently try to move the camera over here and move some of this stuff out of the way. And I hope this isn't coming off like a brag tape. This was a request from a viewer, and uh, we're just going to give a brief tour here. We have an old Hewlett Packard uh, analog voltmeter. This is the 400E. This is calibrated in dB and RMS volts up to 10 megahertz. Uh, very useful if you're doing audio work. Uh, they're still a useful piece of equipment. We've got an old senior voltomist up here that I bought because we used those back in high school and I just had to own one. Uh, we've got a Heathkit solid state VOM. Think VTVM, but the tubes have been replaced with solid state FETs instead of using the thermonic FETs and the vacuum tube voltmeter. Uh, very useful piece. It's got the zero center scale. This one actually does milliampers. Most of your VTVMs don't have a milliampere scale on them. I used to have two of these. I sold one of them and kicked myself immediately because they're very, very accurate meters. But how much junk can you have on a shelf? We've got a Hewlett Packard power supply, zero to 24 volts at 20 amps. And I use that for powering stuff on the bench. I have two binding posts here fed with a pair a doubled up pair of number 10s on each post so there's no voltage drop cigarette lighter output and a pair of binding posts for lower current applications a dual channel uh, power supply here this one's good for about six amps and uh, very handy to have dual channel down below it another zero to 50 volt dual supply and this is only 500 milliamps and people say well what good is 500 milliamps and surprisingly on the bench 90 percent of the stuff you do is probably around 100 milliamps if you're working solid state with small you know small signal equipment so they're quite handy and uh, we're going to try here i'm going to break briefly and lower the camera okay we have another fluke voltmeter this one will read down to the millivolt re region as well uh, the big fluke down there at the end of the bench. They are not millivolt, excuse me, microvolt region. Not millivolt, microvolt. So let's read down to the microvolt. That has one microvolt resolution. And uh, that can come in handy. They are also 10 gig ohm impedance. Below that we have a uh, another Keithley voltmeter. That's just used for general bench top use. I keep that around because it has a 10 amp scale on it. It can be handy once in a while. We have a Boonton slash Hewlett Packard capacitance meter. And uh, when you pick up those bargain ba bags of uh, capacitors at the flea market and you want to sort through them real quickly or if you want to match two small value capacitors you can do it very quickly with that guy. Very handy to have around. We have a uh, an attenuator, 150 watt, up to 6 gigahertz. Put the signal in, signal comes out. With This is 20 dB of attenuation. This adds another 20 dB of attenuation for 40 dB. And that way I can feed that directly into this Hewlett Packard spectrum analyzer down here. This is an 8594E. It has the uh, sweep tracking generator built into it. This covers up to 3 gigahertz from 9 kilohertz to 3 gigahertz. And probably at some point I'm going to want to get rid of that other Hewlett Packard, but it's going to be hard to get rid of that uh, built-in dummy load and all the functionality. Uh, the, the old one does AM, FM, single side band demodulation. Like I said, it does all the two-tone tests. Pretty hard to get rid of that. It's, it's a nice piece of equipment. We have an old Hewlett Packard distortion analyzer, 334A. I use that if I'm working on somebody's stereo or audio, uh, the audio section of a transmitter. Guarantee that the distortion figure is down where it belongs. It's an older piece of gear, but very useful because it has the auto tracking function. Once you've roughly tuned in 
the analyzer, you flip it on auto track and it will null out the last few dB of, uh, of noise and give you the true noise figure. And we have another 12 digit frequency counter underneath there. That's a Hewlett Packard unit. Comes in real handy for uh, dialing stuff in. And all of this equipment, by the way, is tied into that frequency standard. So I know that the frequency counter and the spectrum analyzer and the uh, frequency generator over there, uh, they're all on frequency. I know that everything's correct because it's all tied into that um, standard, the GPS lock standard. Uh, let's see, what have I missed? Oh. I should probably briefly shut this down. Oh no, I'm not going to do that yet. I'm a little bit disjointed here. I have several of these old triplet 630 uh, VTVR, VTVMs, VOMs. I have actually nine of these in different models. This one happens to cover up the 6,000 volts AC or DC. You won't find that on a modern meter. Every time somebody says to me, what do you want that old piece of junk for? Don't you have a digital voltmeter? I know immediately I'm talking to somebody who really doesn't know what they're talking about because these are extremely useful and still very relevant today. Um, I'll do a video at some point on why, but if you, if you know anything about electronics and you know anything about working on, say, automotive or motorcycle electrical systems, you'll understand why these are still relevant. They are extremely useful pieces of equipment. These triplet 630s are extremely accurate. I find them much better than the Simpsons. This thing, I can set it on any voltage. I can read any voltage down here and pair it up with either one of my fluke meters. I can dial in a voltage and looking at this, I'll set the voltage and look at my high-end digital multimeters and I am within 20 to 50 millivolts unfailingly from one end of the scale to the other. They are just beautiful pieces of equipment. Down here we have my Fluke scope meter and my Fluke handheld multimeter. Those are pieces of equipment that I carried on the road for years and years and years. This thing has bailed my butt out of trouble so many times when I was over in Southeast Asia servicing uh, robotic equipment. To be able to go in and find out why something wasn't working properly the multimeter will only take you so far when you're trying to find <clears throat> spurious problems this is the guy you need in your in your kit down here on the end we have an old leader transistor curve tracer and this is an older piece of equipment but still very useful i'll put a link up here for uh Mr. Carlson's lab. Mr. Car I won't do a review on this because Mr. Carlson does a very nice job of explaining how curve tracers work and why they're useful. He, d he has a nice lab. He's got a lot of old equipment and uh, a lot of the stuff I see in his lab I used to have but over the years I've weeded out the older stuff and brought in newer stuff. I got tired of working on the old oscilloscopes that uh, limited bandwidth and you know you're constantly in there replacing stuff so they're, oh, that's not true. They're not that unreliable, but they just, you know, switches begin to get noisy and stuff starts to get, go into a failure mode. So I've moved on. But I, I really, really appreciate that someone like him takes uh, such care of that old equipment. It's nice to see. Anyway, if you're working on amplifiers, whether they're RF or audio, uh oh, my heating system is about to turn on. I'm going to stop this until the, the, the furnace shuts off because it's going to make a racket. Okay, the heating system is shut down. I'm up here in New Hampshire and it's, it is snowing today. And the heating plant kicks on off and on. The lab is down here in the basement and it gets a little bit noisy when it's running. I'm sure the microphones would have picked it up. Another piece of indispensable equipment, if you're going to work on old stuff, is a good tube tester. Now this is an ICO 666, which arguably is one of the best uh, ones that was that's out there available. There is all kinds of different ones. But this will let you test leakage individually on every single element in the tube. All of these levers here, they connect all the elements to the proper operating voltage to the pin socket, so you can test everything individually, plus your merit test. 
you have your grid, plate, filament, voltage like you would have on anything else. This covers everything from the old four pin style tubes right up through pencil tubes. There's two different pencil tube sockets here for the seven pin pencil tubes which are about the diameter of this dowel. And uh, it has a lamp tester. It also has a rudimentary transistor tester for PN, PN, PN and it'll test the beta figures on those. This was built sometime in the 50s. This belonged to my father and came to me. The manual has no zip codes in it, which means it's probably pre-1950 sometime. I don't know the exact date. I do know that I've had several tube testers over the years, and this has been the best one I've ever had my hands on. Uh, my father usually didn't spend a lot of money on things, but this is one piece of equipment he spent a fair, uh, fair amount of money on. He must have bought this right around the time I was born. But it, surprisingly, you're going to find on the older radios that the tubes, it turns out, are one of the more reliable pieces. They have uh, lasted and stood the test of time. 99% of your failures, I find, in the older radios are either capacitors or resistors. And when I say resistors, I'm going to move this in here a little bit and walk around behind the camera, hope I don't knock it down. Especially these old dog bone style and when I say dog bone style I'm talking about the ones that have the wire wrapped around the end there's one here's the second one and the old carbon composition ones uh, and some of those old carbon composition ones well, here's one here we'll pull this one out of a drawer these old carbon composition resistors I have found some of these to be as much as 200% out of tolerance. And usually they're at least 30 to 40%, sometimes 50 to 60%. Uh, probably next to capacitors, I would rate capacitors the number one failure. The paper capacitors fail, the old electrolytics fail. And if you do any work on modern LCD monitors, you know the capacitors and those things fail uh, in the power supply. They're underrated. They make them fail, but so be it. They do fail. Here's a couple of interesting pieces of equipment. This is an LCR meter, and the one next to it is an ESR or equivalent series resistance meter. Now, I bought these as a pair. I got these on the internet, and at the time I bought these, I think seem to remember I paid about $37 for the pair of them. These are now going for like $60 individually, and these are going for, I don't know, $40 or $50 individually. Chinese made, offshore stuff that I said, well, it's a piece of junk, but for the price, it'll give me something to take to the flea markets and let me test stuff at the ham flea markets when I get there. Surprisingly, I have found both of these to be extremely accurate. Uh... Comparing them to my Boonton Bridges, these are within a couple of percent or better of the Boonton Bridge for both inductance and capacitance. I was blown away at how good they are. I charged this one up a year ago and I'm still using it. This one uses AA batteries and the same set's in there over a year now. This is great for working uh, in a circuit. You can test your capacitors in circuit and make sure your electrolytics are good. The voltage it uses is so low that it won't break down a semiconductor junction, so you can test them in circuit 90% of the time and not have to lift the lead. And this will also test extremely low values of resistance. You can test, you know, milliohms with it. This one does inductance, capacitance, and resistance. And the only problem I found with these is the build quality. The banana jacks tend to come loose and fall out. So you have to open the things up tighten up the jacks on the back, the nuts on the jacks. Be careful not to break them because they're extremely cheap. And then put something like a drop of fingernail polish on the nut to keep it from backing off. Other than that, I had no problems with these. Um, interesting pieces, but they work. And of course, over here is a benchtop ionizer when I'm working on uh, sensitive electronics. I have my ionizer running, sits over on the side of the bench. And it, it's also useful to blow soldering fumes away of course, when you get to my age, I like to breathe deeply and claim that's the reason I'm losing my memory is the solder fumes. And last but not least, down here on the end, 
is this junk. Yes, I am one of those. I am a ham radio operator. I have the ham shack set up down here and my computer system with four monitors. Now when I bought this thing, I set up my new computer a while ago to run everything. It runs the radio, it runs the rotators, it ties into all the equipment. I have all the interfaces set up for all of this equipment. I bought the four monitor set up. I said, you know, I'm tired of flipping back and forth between, you know, alt tabbing between screens or having another monitor set off somewhere. So I bought the four big monitors and set everything up. I said, there, I'm good to go. And within a couple of hours, wish that I'd bought the six monitors set up. Yes, I realize it's a sickness, but it's a sickness I can live with. And for those interested, I am. Oh, look at the color balance. That's terrible. Come on back. Let's get that screen. There it comes. Color balance is coming back. I am N1CKX. If you want to look me up on QRZ.com, if you're a ham, you know what that means. And no, this is not chicken band. This is all ham radio. Okay, I guess that about rounds everything up. Uh, if you saw anything here you want to uh, ask questions on, drop me a note. If you see anything you want me to do some kind of video on, drop me a note. Uh, we'll, from time to time we'll be throwing more videos in and we will uh, go over some of this old equipment like the Boonton Q meter. We'll uh, take you through, oh who knows what we'll do. I, I like to go on the uh, YouTube and if somebody's already done a good video on something, I don't want to repeat that. The only things I like to do are those odd pieces of equipment that either somebody has not done something on, or I see a glaring omission in something that some you know that's uh, been presented already. Some of these guys, and I know I've talked on a long time here, so I'm going to bite my tongue and say, some of these guys were vaccinated with a phonograph needle and just like to hear themselves talk. And there is so much bad information out there; it scares me. So I like to, when I find something that's wrong, I'm going to try to correct it. Hopefully I'll be right. Again, thank you for stopping by and look forward to hearing from you. This is the Radio Mechanic. Just realized that I forgot to finish talking about this guy briefly. And again, I'm not going to do a full operational uh, video on this. I cannot improve on what Mr. Carlson has done. I will point out, however, that this has A, B, which means I can put two transistors on this thing at a time. And if you have an amplifier, I think I was right at the point talking about amplifiers when the heating plant came on. Uh, some amplifiers, power amplifiers, be they audio or RF or power supplies, can have from two to as many as eight or more output transistors or semiconductors in parallel. And if you're working on that type of equipment and replacing a bad transistor, it's a good idea to match them, match the characteristics of the transistor you're installing to the ones that are in there so you don't have one transistor hogging all the current. And being able to hook up a reference transistor here and go through your stock of uh, replacement transistors there, you can very quickly do A-B comparison and it saves a lot of time uh, matching transistors. That was all I wanted to add. Thank you.